We're here at the city town hall with Davide Dormino, who is the sculptor of these magnificent pieces that stand behind us. And we're here for a meeting about Julian Assange. And David has flown from Rome and arrived here a few days ago. To Sydney, welcome to Sydney. And this is the first time that these sculptors are here in Australia, is that correct? It's the second, second time. Because the first time was in Melbourne a couple oh, of years, sorry. Of, uh, okay. days ago. But this, it's okay, yes. Yes, this journey it's, it's here. It's the first time in Australia. First time in Australia, <laughs> but second city in Australia. How did it go in Melbourne? I think it, it was a, a good event. Yes. Um, yeah, the, there was a, a beautiful weather. A lot of people was in uh, in the square participating to the event and climbing on the chair. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was very, so tell very me nice. And, and for, finally, we arrived in the country of, of Julian Assange. So that's one of our goals since the beginning of this of the story of this statue. And when, what is the story? Of the, the story starts in 2013, and. Uh, I realized the artwork in 2014, and the first time that we exhibited it was uh, May 1st, 2015, in Alexanderplatz, Berlin. So it's a very symbolic date, and this is the 22nd city. So we, it's because one of the characteristics of this artwork is that it's a traveling statue. So I move it city to city uh, to spread out the, the topic it, it, they pay uh, I decide to pay an homage to the freedom of expression and information and I choose the three individuals they have the courage to revelate to all of us war crimes and whatever of the most powerful government uh, so you you got the idea and tell us about the, how yes. you yes. worked on yes. it, how yes. long it took you. This is bronze, I understand, yes. is that correct? Yes. Yes. And you did it in your studio in Rome? No, I did it in Pietra Santa, next to Carrara, where the cave of marble are, uh -huh. uh, because there there's one of the most important uh, foundry of bronze in Europe, I mean, and they did uh, an amazing job. So I realized the clay model uh, there, and then they took the casting. You, you can visit the website of, okay. of the of the sculpture that is anything to say dot com and you will receive a lot of information. So you can see afterwards. this um, clearly standing here. Tell us about the an empty, chair. <laughs> an empty chair. Yes. Tell us what does that signify? Um, I think that every artwork uh, needs a, a missing piece. Because the missing piece is the is the public that sometimes uh, are involved with the emotion and in other case like this with uh, with an action. So the statue, the, the, oh, the fourth empty chair, is uh, invite the public to take stand next to them, but also for ourselves. Because the chair is a, a comfortable place and we grow up, that is my opinion, when we go out from the comfortable zone and we change our point of view, of course it's a risk because we are more visible, no? We, but also we have a different view on our, or the time that we, that we live in. So arts in this way, and when I say arts I mean all the artistic, uh, the artistic practices. Um, it's it's a way to uh, they gave us the opportunity to read in a different way our times. And of course, these men are now women. Chelsea, Julian, uh, Ed Stone did what they did for the public. Yes, definitely. So when the they public fight, stands with them, they yeah, join together. Exactly, because they fight for our right to know. And in a sense, when we get on that chair, when any person from the public, they become part of this community. Definitely, definitely. definitely. Not exactly equal, because what, very few people have the courage to do what they do. Yeah. But, uh, well, I'm well, very does happy. anyone have the courage to get up on the chair and say something? It's your turn. How many people come? <laughs> how many people actually get up there and speak? I. I don't know. Until today, you mean? Yeah. I think. They just want a photo, do they? Uh, three, 
Snowden. I don't, I don't know. I don't, but a, a lot. A lot. <laughs> Free Snowden. <laughs> Free speech. Stand all the way up. This is beautiful. How many cities you said that you've been to? 20, 22. And how many countries? Um, Germany, France, Switzerland, Italy, uh, Serbia, Slovenia, Australia. And, uh, when are you coming to uh, Washington, New uh, York? Yes, that's one of the goals. Yeah. But Have you gotten any negative easy. reactions, people are saying? Of course. Well, let me hear about of them course. too. Most of the, you know, when you, when you, this, this artwork is, is also very political. Political in, in the sense that when you do something that makes sense for the, for the people, for the human beings, it's dangerous because uh, it's also an invitation to to develop to develop our critical sense, and and this is a very strong weapon. Yeah. For example, the town hall, I understand, did not want so, the chairs on their side. Yeah. So it means that half of the world is against this idea. And the other one is, is, is with. So it depends from which way you want to see this. We're here at the Sydney Town Hall with John Shipton, Julian Assange's father. John, welcome. Uh, you have flown back from a tour of the U.S. just to be here for a couple of days. Why? Well, uh, uh, this is a pretty important occasion. This traveling sculpture is called Anything to Say uh, of uh, Edward Snowden. Chelsea Manning and Julian Assange is an important occasion in Australia. I can't emphasise too much that Australia is the only government withstanding in the relationship with Julian Assange because he's a citizen and now the Australian government is the only government in the world that backs with its di diplomatic skill and its resources the freedom of Julian Assange. I can't emphasize that too much. We won here and we're moving on now to the United States. And how, how's the Australian government doing in terms of what uh, they said they're going to do? Just to advocate for your son. Uh, well, we will see next week when uh, Prime Minister Sunak, Prime Minister Albanese and President, President Biden meet in, in San Diego under the AUKUS uh, flag, if you like, flag. How is the tour going in the U.S. right now? Oh, Bowling got, alleys, yeah, I understand? Yeah, yeah. We got 50... Pulse, Oklahoma? <laughs> Tulsa yesterday. Yeah. Um, nine universities. 52 uh, exhibitions so far, we'll probably go up to about 60, uh, extending into about the 17th of March, after which we'll go down to Mexico for a little bit. But uh, I think the circumstances are that one exhibition is like throwing a small pebble in a pond, two is another pebble, three another pebble, four another pebble, five you're starting to get a ripple. So we've got uh, reviews from Variety, reviews from the Los Angeles Times, and we expect there'll be more reviews of the film. Filmmakers spend fortunes just to get a review, but we get the reviews because of the substance of the, uh, of the film, the substance of the film, and not least, the people of the United States that we meet are really concerned about the abrogation of their holy grail, if you like, or if you're Jewish, the Ark of the Covenant, the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. That's their holy grail, and they want to hang on to it. And they're really concerned about that. And as that, as Julian is part of the First Amendment, then that umbrella covers both sides of the aisle. As you know, Chuck, they're at each other's throats, something fierce in the United States at the moment. Inside of the aisle, they're throwing daggers at each other. But with our thing, they all sit under the same umbrella. They can't throw those word daggers at each other if the First Amendment is abrogated.
So you're getting all kinds of people here, all walks of life. Some of them maybe knew very little about Fulin, and they learned. I mean, they're open-minded to hear the stories. They're good people, they're open-minded to hear the story, and they want something. They're looking for leadership. So you can see that in the phenomenon of Donald Trump, he gets up there and he says, if you want retribution against the deep state, I am your retribution. This automatically puts a ripple right through the United States because somebody's saying what they want. Populist, but it's still what they want. I still believe it after four yeah. years. Well, I don't, I, I'm not that illustrating yes, Trump. Right. I'm illustrating the thirst in the people of the United yeah. States, not Trump. They understand that the both parties have abandoned them, the interests yeah, of the yeah, average yeah, American. Yeah, yeah. And they see the First Amendment issue as being real as well because they've been kicked off Twitter for some reason, uh, as we found from the Twitter files. Finally, uh, the last time that the case went to the High Court, it took eight months for them to decide whether to accept it. We're coming up to at least eight months now. I believe they have a year to decide, is that correct? Or can it go on? As long as they want. I'm told that the, you know they're pretty relaxed about these things and they can wander in the desert for 40 days and nights. But um, I, yeah, we just got to keep on emphasising that the legal thing is a veil pulled over a political persecution of a journalist and publisher who published war crimes, published, didn't steal didn't we just publish equally the New York Times, Le Monde, The Spiegel, Washington Post, uh, El Pay, all published exactly the same thing, but they're not arraigned before a court. So clearly the law doesn't matter. Every single human rights has been abrogated in, in, Julian's, in Julian's case. Every single convention of asylum is abrogated in, abrogated in Julian's case. And all of the due process that's fundamental to the United States and rule of law and the United Kingdom has been abrogated, dismissed in a series of irregularities and malfeasance. It's a disgrace and a scandal. It's ruining the reputation of the United Kingdom, the United States, and already ruined the reputation of Sweden. We can say now that we used to uh, imagine Sweden as a model society. Now all we see Sweden is bad laws and selling junk furniture. Ooh! John, thank you very much. We'll see you in Washington. <laughs> I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present, any of my brothers and sisters who are in the audience today. On behalf of the traditional owners of this land, Nandawabi. Nandawabi! Uncle Jimmy Smith, he's going to do a smoking ceremony. Our great journey to get the truth of, of the colonial process out there and up and running, to get it acknowledged um, instead of this continuous um, unaddressing of of how the country's been colonised. Um, it's a drive, it's a drive for the truth, and Julian Assange, the same powerful drive for the truth, and, um, you know, it is, it is a great thing. And, and, and somebody said it, the truth will set you free, huh? And all these people who are stressed off their bonkers, running around in capitalism, trying to make a living, and um, just get by. Um, they're, they're probably some of the biggest um, prisoners of them all because they, capitalism shuts you down, you know, it shuts your reality down and it pays you some money and says, there you go. Uh, but it's more than that. This is about, about spirituality. Right? This is about your life. This is about your health. This is about your children's health. And this is about your family's health and their well-being as well. So um, I'm happy to be here. And, uh, and to be able to share this ancient process of, of a smoking ceremony with you here this evening. It never happened. Nothing ever happened. Even while it was happening, it wasn't happening. It didn't matter. It was of no interest. It was even witty. 
Tonight, we have three people here who will speak to you of what actually did happen. The first, Dean Yates, a witness to the destruction of Iraq. There, the dispatch officer from Reuters, who knew well the photographer and the journalist that were slaughtered in collateral murder, which you've all seen. Dean has written a book, it comes out June. Be aware that it describes, like the cables, the internal events of a heinous, destructive war that entirely destroyed deliberately an entire nation. I'll pass you over to Dean. Thank you, John. My name is Dean Yates. I was the Reuters Baghdad Bureau Chief in 2007 when an Apache gunship with the call sign Crazy Horse 18 killed two of my staff, Namir Noor Eldin and Sayed Chum. That attack on July 12, 2007 was later made famous when Julian Assange published the footage that he called collateral murder. For nearly three years, Reuters had tried to get a copy of that tape because we knew it existed, because I'd been shown the first few minutes of the tape in an off-the-record briefing by the US military. We knew the tape existed. Reuters lawyers tried to get a copy of that tape through freedom of information requests with the Pentagon every time we were refused. And on April 10, 2000, and on April 5, 2010, when that tape was published, I think we all knew why Reuters was never given a copy of the tape. The tape showed grainy figures on a Baghdad street, hideous pilot banter, cannon shells the size of a man's hand crashing into men on the ground, rules of engagement that have been thrown out the window, and in an attack on a minivan that killed my, the Reuters driver Said, who had been trying to get up, who was badly wounded for nearly three minutes, what all, what international legal experts described as a war crime. By publishing that tape, Julian very quickly made himself an enemy of the United States. And when that tape came out, I was actually in Tasmania on a holiday with my family. And I literally froze with shock and horror because I didn't know what had happened to my staff. For three years, I, we had tried to find out. And unlike Julian, who was, who was trying to tell the world the truth about Iraq, when that tape came out, I basically went into hiding. I was unable to speak about it, even though I knew more about that event than virtually anyone else in the world. I didn't know it at the time, but I had PTSD. I had PTSD as a result of working as a journalist in Iraq in 2003, 2004, and other years as well. But I could not deal with what had happened to my staff, and I just couldn't face it, and so I buried it deep inside myself until six years later, in 2016, I became suicidal. And the reason I became suicidal was because I blamed myself, I failed to protect my staff, but I also blamed myself for not speaking out about what had happened when people like Julian did. And Julian had showed so much courage. Chelsea Manning had showed so much courage in speaking out because they knew what was going to happen to them. They knew the consequences and yet they still did it. And here I was, not having the courage to speak out at the time about what I knew. And so that the moral dimension of what 
had happened to me became very hard to bear and I ended up in a psych ward in Melbourne with coppers, veterans and others. And it was there over a period of time, over a course of three admissions, three years, that I learned that I had to make peace with myself and I did eventually and I forgave myself and I stand before you now uh, much recovered but because I want the world to know that what Julian did by publishing that tape was a pure act of truth-telling. He exposed the lies in Iraq and he showed the world what was really happening in Iraq. And as John talked about in his, in his introduction, the, he, the, the, it's important that we remember the destruction of Iraq now on this 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq because there has never been any accountability for the decision to invade Iraq. There's never been any accountability for the decisions that Australia made to follow the United States into Iraq. And I know what it was like to live in that, that country. Car bombs going off every day. People's family members disappearing. Um, hundreds of thousands of people were killed in Iraq. And Hundred, millions of people were displaced, millions of people had to flee to Syria and Jordan. And this is a country that was destroyed. And until, there's an, until there is an accounting of that, I think it is, it really is a, it's something that we, we just can't let our leaders off lightly without that accountability. And so I just want to thank everyone for showing up today. I, I really appreciate it. And it's, we have to do everything we can to ensure that Julian is brought home. So my final words are, Prime Minister Albanese, bring Julian Assange home now. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Jimmy. The smoke is there. Um, next we have a person who has chronicled the late 20th century in such detail, with such devotion that outside of the State Department and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade who actually plan these crimes, get paid to plan these crimes. Nobody knows more than the next speaker. Nobody has chronicled in depth and shown the extraordinary capacity to realise for us in film and print what has gone on, what has happened, and as a being a witness to what actually happened. It actually happened. John Persia. This is a, an honour to be here and to be in the company of Dean Yates and especially John Shipton. John is an old friend, but in, I would suggest, almost a fourth member of David's wonderful sculpture, and that is John. John's campaign. John's campaign, yes, please clap him. Yes, there has been a film made about John's campaign, but I've seen it over several years, and it is one of the most heroic acts I've seen and known. And I can't pay tribute more to John, his calm, steady uh, support for Julian is utterly inspiring. So, thank you to John, thank you to Dean Yates, <clears throat> and thank you to David for this wonderful sculpture. It's uh, an extraordinary likeness of the sense of what these three men achieved. Uh, you get a sense of their heroism. Uh, so, to have it here in Sydney, I think it's... Uh, itself is almost heroic. Uh, 
but here it is, and I, for one, am grateful. Um, Julian has been a friend of mine for quite a long time now, since he first went to England. Uh, and through almost all of that time, he has suffered incarceration and persecution of, of some kind. He, I liked Julian almost from the moment I met him. Um, I liked his dark sense of humor. He's funny. Um, I liked the fact that he was sharp and uh, not a member of the media club in any way. In fact, not a member of any club. I, I liked his thoughtfulness. I interviewed him at my home in London and his thoughtful pause before answering every question produced something that was incisive and erudite and I came to like Julian very much and to be, I hope, one of his, um, one of his true supporters. I last saw Julian not long ago, it was just before Christmas in Belfast, in uh, Belmarsh prison. Uh, we, he was in relatively good spirits. Uh, for two hours we talked about almost everything, but not the, the case. We, we talked about books, and uh, as I sent him a collection of books, we talked about life. It almost seemed at one point, especially when he laughed, that, that uh, uh, things might be all right. Some things might be all right. But of course, that's not the case. We know that in the arcane system that has imposed itself on Julian, he is still waiting for a judge uh, to uh, approve uh, an appeal to go forward. His laughter and his good spirits, of course, are a shield. When the prison guards began, I notice this every time, began to jangle their keys, and it's their way, they like doing it, it's their way of telling you that time is up and that it's time to go. Uh, he fell, he fell silent. Uh, and normality, this grotesque normality of him in Belmarsh returned. And when I crossed the room to the other side and was leaving, he did as he always did. If you can imagine this, he put his fist in the air with a clenched fist and he shook it in defiance. He is the embodiment of courage. There are those, those who are the antithesis, the opposite of Julian, in whom courage is unheard of, along with principle and honour, stand between him and freedom. I'm not referring to the mafia regime in Washington, whose pursuit of a good man is meant as a warning to us all, but rather to those who still claim to run a just democracy in this country, Australia. Anthony Albanese was mouthing his favourite platitude Enough is enough. <laughs> Long before he was elected Prime Minister last year, he gave many of us precious hope, especially Julian's family. As Prime Minister, he added weasel words about not sympathising with what Julian has done. 
Apparently we have to understand his need to cover his appropriated ass in case Washington called him to order. We knew it would take exceptional political, if not moral, courage for Albanese to stand up in the Australian Parliament, the same Parliament which will disport itself to Joe Biden in May, and say the following. As Prime Minister, it is my government's responsibility to bring home an Australian citizen who is clearly the victim of a great vindictive injustice. A man who has been persecuted for the kind of journalism that is a true public service. A man who has not lied or deceived like so many of his counterfeit in the media, but has told people the truth about how the world is run. I call on the United States, a courageous and moral Prime Minister Albanese might say, I call on the United States to withdraw its extradition application to end the malign farce that has stained Britain's once admired courts of justice and to release Julian Assange unconditionally to his family. For Julian to remain in his cell at Belmarsh is an act of torture, as the United Nations rapporteur has called it. It's how a dictatorship behaves, unquote. Alas, my daydream about Australia doing right by Julian has reached its limits. The teasing of hope by Albanese has now close to a betrayal for which history will not forget him and many will not forgive him. What then, what then is he waiting for? Remember that Julian was granted political asylum by the Ecuadorian government in 2013, largely because his own government had abandoned him. Right. That alone ought to bring shame on those responsible, namely the Labour government of Julia Gillard. Yeah. So eager, so eager was Gillard to collude with the Americans in shutting down WikiLeaks for his truth-telling that she wanted the Australian Federal Police to arrest Assange and take away his passport for what she called his illegal publishing. The AFP pointed out that they had no such powers. Assange had committed no crime. It's as if you can measure Australia's extraordinary surrender of sovereignty by the way it treats Julian. Gillard's pantomime grovelling to both houses of the US Congress is cringing theatre on YouTube. Australia, she repeats, is America's great mate, or is it little mate? Her foreign minister then was Bob Carr, another Labour machine politician, whom WikiLeaks exposed as an American foreman, uh, informant one of Washington's boys in Australia. Carr boasted knowing Henry Kissinger, his hero, his hero. Like other government ministers, Carr claimed that Julian was receiving full consular support from his government. But when Julian's lawyer, Gareth Pierce, and I met the Australian Consul General in London, Ken Pascoe, I asked him, what do you know of the Assange case? Just what I read in the papers, he replied with a laugh. Today, Prime Minister Albanese is preparing this country for a ridiculous American-led war with China. Billions of dollars are to be spent on a war machine of submarines, fighter jets, and missiles that can reach China salivating warmongering by the country's oldest newspaper, the Sydney Morning Herald, is a national embarrassment or ought to be. Australia is a country with no enemies and China is its biggest trading partner. Yep. This deranged civility to aggression is laid out in an extraordinary document 
called the US-Australia Force Posture Agreement. This states that American troops have, and I quote, exclusive control over the access to and use of armaments and material that can be used in Australia in an aggressive war. That almost certainly includes nuclear weapons. China, as the yellow peril, fits Australia's long history of racism like a glove. However, there is another enemy they don't talk about. It's us, the public. It's our right to know and our right to say no. Since 2001, some 82 laws have been enacted to take away these rights and protect the Cold War paranoia of an increasingly secret state. They involve secret courts and secret evidence and secret miscarriages of justice. In this, Australia is said to be a model for the master across the Pacific. Bernard Collery, David McBride, and Julian Assange, deeply moral men who told the truth, they are the whistleblowers and the victims of this paranoia and our national heroes. On Julian Assange, the Prime Minister has two faces. One face teases us with hope of his intervention that will lead to Julian's freedom. The other face ingratiates itself with Joe Biden and allows the Americans to do what they want with us to lay down targets that could result in catastrophe for all of us. The question is this, will Albanese back Australia or will he back Washington? If he is sincere, as some supporters of the Labour Party still think he is, what is he waiting for? If he doesn't secure Julian's release, Australia will cease to be sovereign. We will be little Americans, official. This is not about the survival of a free press, as it's often said. There is no longer a free press. The paramount issue for Julian and for all of us is justice and our most precious human right to be free. Thank you. We next have another witness. This is Stephen Kenny, acted as solicitor for David Hicks. Stephen has been to Guantanamo Bay, has been in the belly of the beast and seen the effects. He's now Julian's lawyer. Australian lawyer. I commend you to listen to Stephen Kenny. And I thank. Now, just to editorialise, just a second, if you will allow me. I was reading Cy Hirsch's essay on Daniel Ellsberg, and he says, Well, I adored him. It's not some a word we use amongst us in Australia. But I have to say, I adore these men who will speak to us and who have done life's work at immense cost. Julian, John Pilger, Edward Snowden, Chelsea Manning, David McBride, and they bring further witness. It did happen and is happening. Stephen Kenny. And I think many of us adore you too, John. Yes, look, can I just add um, my acknowledgement and respect for who is now my friend John and the wonderful work he's doing for his son. I mean, Julian could be truly proud of him 
and know that he is really doing everything he can. Um, the amount of work that he does is, is, is just incredible, and I am so glad to be able to be part of it and to know John. And I'd also like to give another round of applause for John Pilger as well. I mean, how true was all of that? And so there's no need to repeat it, but I'll talk, I'll talk a little about um, British justice. And my ancestors who are Irish knew about British justice, but I'll just tell you what Julian's facing. He had his first hearing in 2020, and now, it is only now, that he's actually able to appeal the bits that he missed out on appealing uh, and the rulings that were made against him. I guess it's the clock telling him it's time to speed up this process. He won the first round. The Americans appealed. He couldn't cross appeal because the court's procedure didn't allow it. So he had to wait until that was heard and a decision was made sometime later and then the Minister for State agreed to his extradition and only then could he reappeal. And he did, and he has. And in November, he filed all the documents he needed to. And it's only an application for leave to appeal. So some judge has got to just look at the papers. There's no hearing required. Five months later, there is no response. I mean, seriously, what is going on here? It's just a symbol of what's happening. But you need to take in mind, this is why we need to keep up the momentum. You need to keep supporting Julian. Because if he gets leave to appeal, there'll be an appeal hearing in six to nine months. And then there'll be a judge who will sit on it and think about it. And another six to 12 months will make a decision. And then the Americans will probably appeal because Julian should win his appeal. And so we're looking at two, three, four years before his legal process is to be completed in the UK before we even start to go to America, and that's years. So you all know this is a political prosecution. It requires a political decision. And our Prime Minister has effectively made a promise to the Australian people he will bring this to an end. And I say to the Prime Minister, enough talking is enough. We need some action now. And the Prime Minister has the perfect opportunity next week in San Diego. The Australian people will look more fondly on him if he stands up for justice instead of war machines. And I think you'd be happier and he would be you know, more popular in Australia if he came back and said, look, I'm sorry I didn't get a submarine contract, but I did get an arrangement for Julian Assange to come home. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Um, gather round a bit. Now, I have to editorialise just for two minutes they've given me. That was proposed that there would be a submarine base in Fremantle. Equally proposed that there would be another submarine base in the Brisbane River. There was during the Second World War. A nuclear submarine, an SSGN, carries 24 ICBMs or 24 TLAMs, cruise missiles. Each ICBM carries seven re-entry vehicles. Nuclear tip. Seven times 24, one submarine based in Fremantle of atomic bombs. The same in Brisbane. Each B-52 housed in Darwin has a canister in its bomb bay which holds six T-LAMs, cruise missiles, nuclear tipped. In the racks in the wall beside it, a total of 20. 26 nuclear bombs housed in Darwin. 
nuclear war planners know that the other side has got a lot of missiles, many missiles, 5,200. How do you cope with that? In Dakota and Utah, they have silos where they put their nuclear missiles in. And they say that's to keep the missiles safe from attack. What it actually is, is a sponge to seduce the opposition war planners to fire all their missiles, not all, a lot of missiles into the sponge in order to destroy the silos. What do you imagine the planners in China and the Department of Defence in the Pentagon calculate about the B-52 bombers in Darwin, the submarine base in Fremantle, the submarine base in the Brisbane River. What do you imagine they calculate? Well, if we can use a X number of missiles on those three targets, there will be less targets on the continental United States. That's the reality of nuclear war planning. That our de Department of Defence is not so innocently... For I'm sure they've got brains. I'm sure they understand salvos. I'm sure they understand leakers. That's the salvos that get through. They understand all that. They learn the maths at the University of New South Wales cam cam campus, used to call it Duntrim. They learn those things. They have that knowledge. And we depend upon men like Peter Cronow. I'm putting Peter on the spot here deliberately. Julian Assange. Chelsea Manning, John Pilger, David McBride, Bernard Collery. We actually, our lives, our future, depends upon the courage of those gentlemen to reveal to us what I have just spoken to, uh, about. And not only to reveal to us, but help us face the actuality that some people in the Department of Defence in the United States, the Department of Defence in Australia, know these things, know the maths, do the calculations, are aware of it. Anyway, my two minutes are up. And so the next speaker is the artist Davida Domino. Every action stems from a need, and often needs are the processing of a lack. For me as an artist, an inspiration sprouts from a question. How can I, through art and sculpture, give shape to the freedom of speech and information, and to the courage? The answer was the fourth empty chairs next to Assange, Manning, and Snowden. The fourth empty chair invites the single individuals to stand up instead of sitting like the others. Art reaches where politics fail, creating bridge which unite the boundary of the human soul. Art cannot change the world, but it has the capacity to give us a different vision, to show us the contradiction of our time and see the world with new eyes to develop our critical sense. A friend today gave me an advice and I wanna read you what he told me. 
you don't need to be the Wheaton man to know which way the wind is blowing. Thank you all. Thanks to the Wow Holland Foundation, the Assange campaign, John Pilger, John Shipton, Evelyn from Austria, and all the people who make this possible. Finally, the statue of Julian Assange arrived in his country. Free Assange. We have two more for you. One is uh, David McBride. It's my belief, firm belief, that the end of the war in Iraq was begun by the revelations in the cables, 250,000 Department of State cables, and the 400,000 Iraq war logs. It's my belief that the revealing began a process of the ending of that war. It's also my belief that David McBride's revelations in Afghanistan began the panicked end of that war. David McBride. Hand for my friend Edward Snowden. Uh, fantastic to see everybody here tonight. What a night, hey? Yeah. What are we going to do with Julian Assange? Free him! Free him, that's right. Let's wake up the crowd. You know, the good news is we are going to win this. We are going to win this. And you are going to be so, so proud of yourself. So, so proud of yourself that we are winning. We are winning a great victory as a tiny minority. A tiny minority. Uh, we are the 300 Spartans. We are taking on something that you can be very, very proud of. Don't be afraid of the fact uh, that the great big cream puffs of Pompeo and the Americans are against us. They will fall. They will fall and they'll be embarrassed that they will look like the sort of idiots that pushed for the Vietnam War uh, and then had egg on their faces when everybody, it became quite clear that that war was an absolute abomination resulting in the death of a million people in Southeast Asia, uh, irreparable damage to the American uh, psyche and the Australian psyche. It was an embarrassment. And you know who Albanese is going to look like? Albanese is going to look like Harold Holt. He's going to look like Billy McMahon. He's going to look like all those people that crawl to the Americans. What I do believe, he's probably going to release Julian Assange just before the next election to try to look big. But by then, we will be effectively another state of the United States. You know, I know that Richard Miles has got a picture of Donald Trump on his wall. He's got a picture of Joe Biden on his wall. He has sold us out so completely. We are now part of the US Navy. We are now part of the US Air Force. We can only go to war if the US goes to war. Uh, we will definitely go to war if the US goes to war. We do. There is no longer a country called Australia as far as international relations go, and that is a disgrace. That is an absolute disgrace. I'm going to finish with a couple of stories. Imagine if you were an Iraqi, Iraqi mother, say, back in 2005, 2008, and your husband, who's a hard-working taxi driver, gets pulled over by the British or the Americans and he gets tortured to death. Like, as happened so many cases, even though he was just a taxi driver and some idiot soldiers decide that he's Al-Qaeda and they torture him over a period of days and he dies. Now, imagine uh, that there was no inquiry and you went to get justice and you understand that mistakes happen in wars, but you went to get justice and you found out that that inquiry was a sham, that nobody got blamed, 
And then the Americans even tried to cover up that it even happened at all. Now, this is just one case. 25,000 murders were, were deleted from the records by the Americans. How would you feel if you're an Iraqi and you knew that? And that's fact. How would you feel if you're an Iraqi and you were just trying to take your kids to school and they were shot to pieces by an Apache helicopter like we saw in Collateral Murder, and you're carrying your five-year-old who's dead or dying, and then the Americans tell you it didn't even happen. How would you feel if you were the last remaining person in Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria and everyone in your family had been killed, and not only had they been killed, the Americans, uh, the Australians had lied about the fact that it happened and then papers like the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Sydney Morning Herald uh, lied about it as well and they didn't even cover Assange. How would you feel? I know how I'd feel. I'd be get strapping some explosives and I'd be going to America. And that is what will happen. That's what I would do and why wouldn't you? And you know why this is important? Because they know, they know there is a man called Julian Assange. They know there is one person in the West who stood up. One person in the West who said no. One person in the West who didn't do anything except expose the truth of what went on in Iraq. And that was enough. It was so disgusting. It was so despicable. And it wasn't just the Americans. It was all the lackeys. It was the Germans. Everything. The diplomats. It was lies. Everything about uh, the Western way of war was a lie. And one man exposed it. And what did we do? We put him in jail. And what did the Sydney Morning Herald do? They said nothing. The Washington Post, the New York Times, they're complicit. The future of the, the world, it's not an exaggeration to say the future of the world depends on this case. If we let Julian Assange die for exposing war crimes, death, murder, lies, what do you think is going to happen to someone who tries to expose a mass murder? Say they decide to go and kill um, a, a nationality. Say in East Palestine they just kill everybody that, that's a witness to the terrible thing and they just murder them all. What's going to happen to the whistleblower? They're going to get killed. They're going to get put in jail. They're going to be charged under the Espionage Act. If we don't stand up now... There will be no, there will be thousands more Julian Assanders and there will be no justice. There will be no justice if we don't stand up now. Now, you are all doing that. You are all doing that. Now, 250 years ago, white people came here and we started a settlement not far from where we're standing. Obviously, for many, many unlimited thousands of years, there were already people here and I believe their magic is here with us today. Australia, uh, my ancestors were convicts. Uh, my grandfather fought in the Second World War. I often think, what would they want us to do? What would they want us to do? People who came and fleed from Europe, they could have gone back to Europe. They didn't want to go back to Europe. Europe was corrupt. Europe provided no chance of a decent life for someone without money and someone who wasn't prepared to of a life of crime uh, disguised as establishment action. This country gave us a life. This country, my parents got scholarships. They were the first people in their family to get to university and I imagine many people here are the same. This country is not the United States. Richard Miles is an idiot if he thinks we have shared history. We have a very different history. We are not based on slavery. We're not revolving around guns. We are a different country. We stand for truth. We stand for no bullshit. We stand tall in the face of adversity. We don't bow down to other countries. It's ridiculous that now the China, the China uh, hysterical people running around like chooks with their heads cut off their head, they say, oh, okay, China's not going to invade us but they're going to do industrial uh, invasion. They're going to, like, uh, bring their corporations here and they're going to um, uh, influence our politicians. They say that with a straight face when all our politicians, 
all our corporations are completely owned by a foreign country already. And it's despicable and it's disgusting. You people are standing up to it. This is Australia. We don't want to be American. Uh, if we wanted to be American, go and live in America. And we need to stand up to the people who say it's okay to put truth tellers, to put people who stand up for dead Iraqis, stand up for law, stand up for justice. The country that says it's all right to murder whistleblowers, we say no. I'm standing in trial and I'm happy to go to jail. It will probably be the only way I'll get justice because this government is so bent. We are so beholden to the Americans. But I'm going to go to jail and I know when I go to jail, everyone here is going to support me. Everyone here is going to support my children. I'm not just talking, I'm living by example because it means so much. It is so damn important. I've got 15-year-old kids just like most people here. Uh, if you're not young people yourselves. What sort of world will we leave them if we leave it where whistleblowers, anyone who speaks up about corruption, anyone who speaks up about murders, anyone who does the right thing gets chucked in jail? What sort of a dystopian, disgusting world will that be? It's not good enough for our children. It's not good enough for our ancestors. We stand up. We stand up for justice. Our enemies only care about money. They would sell Australia for a hundred billion. They would drink our blood if they thought there was a good return on it. They hate us. They have fooled us. We are here and we will beat them. The great thing is we will beat them because we are right. And whenever people are right, they end up triumphing. I always, when I think of Julian, I think of a guy called Tyndall. Tyndall was a churchman who decided, quite rightly, he couldn't believe that the, the, the priests of the time in the 1500s wouldn't let the normal people read the Bible. And they, he would, they would tell them what was in the Bible, and Tyndall would say, well, that's not actually what the Bible says. And they'd say, shut up, you don't understand. It's more important that we put out our doctrine then you, what, you tell them what's actually in the Bible. Now, Tyndall made a point to say, I'm going to let people know the truth. And he translated the Bible into English. Uh, and you know what they did? The state killed him. The state killed him. Just because, like Assange, he wanted the people to know the truth and they did not want... So people in government, you are the people that would have killed Tyndall. The Henry VIII's hideous, hideous courtiers that wanted a pay rise and they killed Tyndall and a couple of years after Tyndall was dead, his Bible became the official Bible. But that's the sort of situation we're living in. They can't handle it. They can't handle anybody exposing the truth. But the truth will always win, just as it did in Tyndall's case, just as it has every other case. So be proud of yourselves. Be proud of yourselves for turning out here day in, day out. Uh, it's not popular. A lot of people don't like Assange. It's made up on very spurious grounds. But you are right. We are right. We will win and you will be so, so proud for the legacy you leave for your children because you stood up when people had to stand up and most people didn't do it. So we have, uh, we'll round out with uh, James McGlone singing you another song. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming along. And uh, terrific speakers. If you could all just gather around the, the statues and we can get our photographers to take a group shot, you know, as evidence that we're actually here. <laughs> Free, free, free Assange! Free, free, free Assange! Thanks, everybody. Okay, I do have something to say. People will form an opinion no matter how little they know. So make sure they've got all the facts. That's all I have to say. Free Assange!